with fall vegetables, uh, fall is a great time to plant several things. And, in, and fall is my favorite time to plant food because the pests are not near as bad. That's the number one reason. But then also, you know, when you're growing food in the spring, there's that kind of anxiety of when is it going to be really hot? When is it going to be really hot? Because you never know. It could be like mid-April that we get 100. Like, you just never know here. And lettuce and spinach and kale do not like heat. And when it gets hot, they bolt and they go to seed and they stop producing leaves and you're done. So in the spring, there's that kind of anxiety I have the whole time. When fall, there's none of that. Because the great thing about greens is they sweeten up as it gets colder. So spinach and kale specifically, you plant them right now and they're gonna grow until about November. They're gonna go dormant. You're gonna be able to get some harvest off of it now. Not a huge harvest necessarily. You don't wanna harvest a bunch of, it, bunch of it. But it's gonna go dormant over November and then it's gonna come back. It's gonna survive all winter. Kale is from Russia, so it, it, can, it can handle our winters just fine. And it's gonna survive all winter and then come back in the spring. And in January and February, we're gonna have a ton of those greens available. So we, we do harvest some now, but we grow a lot now, just mostly so that in the spring, it is popping immediately, you know, in, in January and February. And then we plant seeds for that stuff around that same time that comes up in April and May, and then that's my later crop. So, so greens are something we grow a lot of in the fall. We're planting a lot of them now. Lettuces are not hardy. They, uh, they were not over winter, but we grow them now to eat now. So they're, it's about 30 to 45 days, depending on the variety. So if you plant it now, you'll have some by the end of October for sure um, that you can have lettuce. And, and it would not generally overwinter. It's a lot more, it's not as resilient to the cold as the others, but it's nice to have now. So uh, there's a lot of other types of, of greens too. I wouldn't just limit it to lettuce, kale, and spinach. There's Swiss chard and arugula and this whole world of other greens. And we like to, to grow a bunch of them and mix them together. So beets or something that we grow for the greens more than for the, for, the, for the root crop. And we just mix that into our mix. And we basically view our house as like our own customized Chipotle every day. We just like throw in like a little burrito or a little mix or whatever and just throw in whatever we have from the garden. And we like to use our greens as kind of the backbone for that. And then we pile in other stuff on top of that. So greens are the number one thing I would mention to start growing in fall. Uh, the second thing, kind of I mentioned the beets and that kind of leads us into this, our root crops. So root crops are also great to grow in the fall. They also sweeten up as it gets colder. So carrots especially, if you plant them now and then harvest them in November-ish, they're gonna be sweeter than any carrot you've ever had. Because uh, they sweet, that's the plant's response to cold. It's whenever it gets really cold, it produces sugar to keep itself from freezing as easily. So like that's, it's just biology. Um, so, um, and the root crops obviously, there's carrots and beets and radishes and turnips. There's this whole world of root crops. If you're starting out and you're new to growing, radishes are a great thing to start with because they're incredibly easy and fast. Like 30 days, you'll have a little radish. It was the first thing I grew and I was so excited. I didn't like it, I didn't really eat it. I mean, I don't like the way it tastes, but our rabbit loves it and our rabbit you know, has manure that goes into our garden. So, I mean, that's, um, which kind of leads us in, I wanna talk about a, a fringe thing here, which is utility crops. So root crops are a lot of things that I grow, not necessarily for the purpose of me eating that plant, but because I'm gonna use that plant for something else. So radish is a perfect example of this, where I feed a lot of it to our rabbit, and then the manure goes into my compost. Or I just use that radish straight in the compost. And the reason why I say radish is because their varieties, like daikon radish, is huge. And its taproot goes way down in the ground, and it pulls nutrients up that other plants don't have access to. So when those nutrients get pulled up, it's gonna store them in the plant itself. Then I'm gonna take that plant, go put it in my compost. Now those nutrients are going into my food eventually. So that's the way, and comfrey is another plant. Comfrey and daikon radish, if you're gonna grow any two utility crops like that, I'll mention those two. And then any plant that is in the legume family. Um, these are peas and beans, there's a lot of plants, but basically the reason why I say legume family and why that's important is because any plant that's in that family specifically can take nitrogen out of the air and put it into the soil. Most plants cannot do that. They rely on nitrogen coming into the soil from rain or from a cow or from whatever, you know. But legumes can actually take it out of the air and put it down into the soil. And then the plants that are around them are helped by that. So we're growing a lot of cover crops. And then what I just told you is cover crop. So if you ever heard that before and you weren't sure, that's what cover crops is. It's that simple. So we grow a lot of those in the spring too, I mean in the fall, um, which leads us into talking about peas, which are something else that grow great in the fall. Um, we always have some form of bean or pea growing in our garden, 
and we have a strategy for when it is, and it's real simple. Uh, on the spring and in the fall, it's peas, because they like the cold. And even over winter, there's Austrian peas that I grow here that over winter, and I don't necessarily um, grow them all the way to full size. It's I grow them and then I chop them down and I till them into the soil. Or peas are another thing that you can eat the entire plant. You don't have to wait for it to produce a pea. Um, you can eat the shoots of it. And, um, and that's a great way to eat it. Broccoli is another way. It's technically too late probably to start broccoli now if you want to grow it all the way to having a huge head. But I don't really grow broccoli that way anyway. I grow broccoli mostly as a microgreen. So I plant, uh, if I have like a, a square, I do square foot gardening still mostly. I kind of view my garden into little squares. And if I have a square of broccoli, then I'll plant the whole thing full of broccoli seeds. And then I'll harvest those seeds whenever they're about, or the sprouts when they're about this tall. And then I'll let the largest one win and take over. But, but that's how I eat most of my broccoli anyway. And the idea behind that is it's basically just microgreens. Have you heard the microgreens term before? All that is, is it's a plant that has a lot of nutrition in it, like broccoli or kale or something like that. And you take the seed and you soak it and you let it sprout. And then once it sprouts, it has all the nutrition from that seed, plus all the nutrition that's added from a couple rounds of photosynthesis and just from the plant doing its thing. So it's, it's considered more nutritious than just the seed version, and that's basically a, a microgreen. So we have a lot of those growing throughout our garden of stuff that I'm just harvesting at random, you know, random stages like that. So we've talked about lettuces, root crops. I touched on broccoli a little bit. It's, like I said, it's too late to get a full-size harvest out of it, but you could do a microgreen now. And that leads us into talking about the next thing. So perennial herbs. Now is a great time to plant them. Uh, perennial anything. When I say perennial, that's just something that comes back every year. So a tree, a rosemary bush, strawberries, blackberries, all of these things are perennial plants that go dormant in the winter and then come back. Now is the perfect time to plant them. Um, mostly because in the spring it can be rough against the heat thing. So if you plant it too late in the spring and those roots can't get established before the heat comes, the plant really stresses and it can die during that. Um, a similar thing can happen in the winter. If you plant it too close to winter, the cold can stress it. So right now is perfect. We're like two months out from our first free freeze probably. The plants will have plenty of time to get roots set. When the freeze happens, they'll go dormant. They'll come great back in the spring. So all of those things are great to plant now. And I highly encourage you to, to grow a bunch of herbs. Uh, we grow oreganos and sages and rosemaries and thymes and we put them everywhere because they really help your other plants. The reason for that is that pests find what they're looking for through smell. So if you have an entire bed of, of tomatoes and it's nothing but tomatoes, the tomato hornworm, has a really easy time finding it. But if you have basil that's surrounding your tomato and you have oregano and you have rosemary and all these things that are strongly scented, it's very difficult for the pest to find it. And if they do find one, they're just gonna find that one. They're not gonna find the whole row of it. They're gonna, I've got, like the way I grow those, I don't, I don't have a term for this, the big ticket items, the stuff the pests really like, you know, the tomatoes, the broccoli, stuff like that. I only have one in a bed. And it's in the middle of a bed and it's surrounded by other stuff. Because you got to remember too, pests are small, right? And especially the ones that are on the ground, like if they come up on a raised bed and it's surrounded by a bunch of other stuff, they may not even go in the middle to see what's in there. And the flying ones, obviously, you know, but like I, I think of my garden as a, as a war ground, really. And I don't use any pesticides or anything like that because uh, really the practical reason is because I think it's harder to grow food with pesticides. Because if you put down pesticides, now I'm killing every bug. The first bugs that are going to come back are the bad ones. Now I'm on the hook for hunting these bad bugs all the time. And that just is not a practical way to garden. And, and when you go look in the forest, like there's no one out there spraying anything. It just works, right? Like the, the good bugs naturally win. And, and that's the way we try and view our garden now. So the first year was kind of rough. We had a lot of pest issues. And then it got better because ladybugs started making home there. And now ladybugs take care of all of our aphids and all of our, they eat a lot of, uh, of eggs, of bad stuff too. I mean, they just, they're voracious eaters. Um, we have praying mantis everywhere. We have like eight or weavers in our garden now. The spiders, Charlotte from Charlotte's Web, you know, they're super colorful, they look poisonous, but they're not. You can handle them if you want, they're super friendly. And I feed them. When I find squash bugs, I throw them in the thing. Mostly out of vengeance, you know, it's just a satisfying feeling to see the spider take care of the squash bug. I mean, we talk a little, you know. So, um, so yeah, but that's how we try and do our garden is we try and have this ecosystem where it's just you know, all of this stuff, and I don't put down any pesticide unless, I mean, there's a few situations, I don't do pesticide, but I, I have used diatomaceous earth, which um, it's fossilized remains that are taken from the bottom of lake beds, and it's just basically it's just super tiny particles that clog, the po that clog the pores of insects. So it doesn't use any chemicals to kill them, it's strictly just suffocating them. 
but the problem is it can suffocate bees and beneficials too. So I will only use that maybe around the bed of a squash plant, you know, like around the base of it. But I will say that squash bugs are resilient to diatomaceous earth in their adult form. It only works on the, on the babies. So, um, and again, all of this information, everything I've told you today should be in the app. That was the whole point of making the app was I had to get all this information out of my head and that was the easiest way for me to do it. And we're constantly updating it. Uh, my wife is heavily involved. She's typed everything in there because if I typed it, it would be super boring, I promise. That's just I'm a very, very literal writer. So, you know, um, sh and she adds in a lot of recipes and things like that. So this is all, this is all in the app. So let me think about what else um, would be great to grow in the fall before we start talking about what to do over the winter. Um, you know, I, 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 didn't miss, I didn't specifically mention strawberries earlier, but now would be a good time to plant them as well. Does anyone have any questions about specific things you want me to talk about before I just start talking about what to do over the winter and next spring and all that? Yes, ma'am. Weed control. Okay, yes. Thank you for bringing this up. So let's talk about this. Um, so whenever we started our garden, we started with just two raised beds that were built on top of grass like this. And I put the black weed cloth below it because that's what the square foot gardening book told me to do. And that did not work at all. That was completely useless. Don't even waste your money on that stuff. Um, what I do now, what I recommend, is one of two ways. One, um, we've been using a lot of smart pots containers, which are fabric raised beds that sit on top. We've been doing a lot of that around our porch and stuff. Um, but we also have a huge garden area that was in the grass, and I think you need to have a mix of both. So in that area, what I did was, uh, the first year I fought Bermuda the whole time and hated it. And then I went to winter, uh, and then I came back, and I was like, that's not happening again. And I did a lot of hiking over the winter. And on those hikes, I noticed the forest, like I started studying the forest. Because once I started growing food and it didn't work too well, I started just studying the forest, see how it works there. And what I noticed was all on the forest ground, there were like six inches of fallen bark and tree limbs, like little like leaves and just a mix of stuff, right? And I was like, well, this is just mulch, right? And that is what led me to the back to Eden gardening method, which basically just says you cover the ground with cardboard and then cover that with a foot of wood chips. And what happens is the Bermuda dies off because it's suffocated from the cardboard. Worms come up, and that cardboard is gone in six months. And worms start to eat that. Those, those wood chips, after like a year, become great soil. And then what you do is plant in place. So our strategy was to build raised beds. We have raised beds everywhere. Those raised beds are covered with uh, cardboard below. And then they have the raised bed on top, and they're surrounded by a foot of wood chips all around. Now, that was the beginning strategy because we want to start growing right then. Now what's happened is all around those raised beds where we have the wood chips, that is great soil to plant in. So I am planting a ton of rosemary and oregano and catnip and all of these herbs around in that area because it's just an easy way. It's just always going to be there. And then my beds, I'm leaving for annual stuff that does need turnover because I don't want to be growing lettuce inside of like a wood chip area. Because when I harvest lettuce, I want to get a bunch of it. and I, I, I'm a very impatient person. So I just, I don't have time to be picking out wood chips. So I'm just, I'm just gonna buy it, right? I mean, so, so I grow my lettuce and stuff inside of greens and inside of beds that are, I, I keep everything out. I'm able to harvest it quickly. I've got this whole system for washing them. Again, all this is on like our YouTube channel and stuff like that, where I, I show all, how I would do all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I would recommend if you're starting out, cover the ground with, with cardboard, get big pieces of cardboard. Because the first time I tried this, it was like a bunch of Amazon boxes and then the Oklahoma wind, like, and then it was like I'm chasing Amazon boxes for an hour. Don't do that. Um, so if you do want to use small boxes, put a sprinkler so at least waters them in. Like, but then like the rain blows the water. It was a mess. That was a that was a mess day. Um, so so what I learned from that experience was to get really big boxes, um, which is pretty easy to find really big boxes. Uh, don't go to like big chain stores because they have cardboard processes and they don't want to talk to you about them. They're not very friendly about that. But, you know, I found TV installation companies like the Harley Davidson store, which is a chain, but they're pretty cool about things. Um, you know, just think places that get really big boxes and go to them and say, can I have some of your big boxes? And they're more than happy. Um, so that's how you take care of the box part. The wood chip part, um, there is a compost facility in Norman, and there's more other, around everywhere, where you can get wood chips for free as much as you want. Uh, trust me, I went and got a truckload of wood chips like every other day for like a year and a half filling my backyard, but it was my free gym membership. And I was like 40 pounds lighter back then, I need to do it again. Because it was a nice workout, like I, I work from home and I would go like take my lunch break and just go unload wood chips and that was my day of, you know, workout, which is unloading wood chips. And my eight-year-old daughter and I have it down to a science, we can do it like 30 minutes, we are fast on it. 
There's other services out there like chipdrop.com is a service where landscapers can go on, on there and find people that want wood chips. And then when they go to cut down a tree for someone or something, they'll chip it and then they'll break it and dump it on your lawn. And it is a huge pile. There's a time-lapse video on our YouTube of us unloading one of these over the course of three days. It was a pile the size of three of my cars. It was huge. Um, but it was fun. I kind of like, I, I'm weird. I really like unloading wood chips. I don't know. If I had to do it for my job full time, I would hate it. But I stare at computers all day, so I kind of like just going out and unloading wood chips. But, you know, the point is all this is free. Um, and then the raised beds themselves, my first raised beds, I, I went to Lowe's, I bought the lumber, I did all that way. And then after that, I thought, well, that, that could be expensive, you know, and then and I, I didn't want to keep doing that as we were starting to scale. We started, it was just like two little raised beds, you know, but then it takes over a whole backyard and I got to get, I got to get, you know, try and talk my wife into this. So I start trying to find other ways to save money and pallets really helped out with that. So you can find pallets all over the place. I will say some things though about pallets. Um, there are pallets that are treated with chemicals. You do not want to be dealing with that. Uh, you do not want to do that. But it's really easy to find the ones that aren't because they have a stamp on them that says HT and there's a circle and that stands for heat treated. So if it has that stamp on it or if it's cedar, I found a lot of cedar pallets. Cedar is great too. And we've used that to build a lot of our raised beds too. So we just tear those apart and then uh, just rebuild raised beds out of them. So that's, that's a way to save money. Um, yeah, I think if you're, if you're looking to start out, the biggest expense you're going to have and the expense you do not want to skimp on is the soil. So uh, I make a soil mix that is part peat moss, part vermiculite, and then mostly compost. So it's like 50% compost and then 25% peat moss and 25% vermiculite. On the compost, I try and source it from as many places as I can. So... Um, now, this is something you gotta be careful of that I wanna go into a little bit because the first year, one of the mistakes we made with compost was I got it from everywhere. I needed as many sources as I can get. And one of the sources uh, was horse manure. And those horses were grazing on fields that were sprayed with uh, an herbicide called aminopyrrolid that can last three years uh, through the manure and then wreck your tomatoes three years later, which it did. And my first year, every single one of my tomatoes died and I involved a soil scientist from OSU to figure it out. The guy was going to figure out what happened here. And, and that was what happened. So um, I'm really careful now about compost. About um, If I'm going to bring in from a new outside source, I will test it first. And I have a video that shows how you can test it. Unfortunately, it takes 21 days to test it. Because to test it, you plant peas inside of the compost cup in a cup. And then you see if they're deformed after 21 days. So, eh, you know, like it's not a fast test. And there's not like a lab you can send an analysis to that doesn't cost thousands of dollars right now. So, so that's really the best way to do it. So um, uh, I've, I can save you some of the work. Um, I, I've no, I'm not getting any money from them, but I'll tell you Murphy's uh, Soil Mix, and they have all sorts of products and stuff. I've bought from them. I've tested it all. It's all been good. Markham's Nursery, uh, their Red Bud Mix, I've used it. It's been, it's been tested. It's been good. So I can, if you're looking, you know, or, I'm sorry, not uh, Minic Materials too. Minic Materials is who I'm thinking of. I have not used Murphy, so I'm not saying bad things about Murphy, I just have not used it, so I cannot say it. Minic is definitely good stuff, and that's what I've tested. They're so close, and I always get them confused. Um, so, yeah, that's basically how you can save money, you know, on, on starting out with your soil mix. Um, it, 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 and, and an easy way to combine those three together, too, because that was, in the beginning, it was a lot of work just trying to combine these things of equal parts together in a mix on a tarp, and it was a pain. And then I found this hack of taking a compost tumbler. Have you seen those above ground compost tumblers? They're useless for making compost, but they're great for making soil, for mixing soil. So, um, and then the, the great thing is, is because they're terrible for making compost, they're on Craigslist all the time. So I just buy them up and then I use them to make soil mix. So it's basically just like a concrete mixer, you know? So I'll just put a bucket of each thing inside of it and then spin it around a few times and then dump it out right in the raised bed that I'm trying to fill. And that little hack saved me so much time. Like, I, can't, I was so excited when I figured that out. It was like my eureka moment because I had three raised beds to fill and I was like, I do not want to do this again. There's got to be a better way. And yeah. Any other questions that I can, I can ramble about anything, so. My, so my name is Del Spoonmore and from Seed to Spoon, is the name of, of our thing that we're doing. It's, so it's my wife and I, and then we've brought in a friend of mine that's a software developer to help me build code. So it's, it's the three of us right now. And then my niece, um, my niece Morgan is a great writer and helps us edit. And then I've got a friend named Annie that's been in the horticulture industry and her whole life and loves plants. And she helps us make sure all the data is accurate. She has a master's and all that. And she 
you know, she's kind of our, uh, we're trying to think of it. We're, we're at the point now we got to come up with titles for people and stuff. It's weird. Like, a year ago, this was like a YouTube channel that I was doing out of my backyard, you know? Like, I feel very blessed. Any other questions about any of the specific vegetables? I can ramble about other stuff, and I can talk about what to do over the winter next, if y'all just want to hear that. But if there's anything specific, yes. Indoor gardening. Cool, that's what we're doing over the winter. So you led me right into it. So um, we're, we're rounding out the, the gardening season for the most part. I talked about five things you can grow. And if you missed that part or came in at the end of it, there's a video on my website that talks about, it's a five-minute video, a short one. Talks about five different things you can grow. So uh, check that out. But over the winter, um, we do a lot. And I love growing over the winter. It's, um, you know, it, our garden blows up in a hurry, and it's this jungle. And I go out there and I pick food, but it's this unmanaged jungle. And, and I've let my OCD go with my garden. I've let it become a jungle because indoors is my little facility where I have grow lights everywhere and I have like, you know, all this stuff and I'm trying all these different ways of starting seeds and I'm usually fighting aphids because they find their way indoors and I don't have ladybugs indoors. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of where this whole world of indoor gardening starts up. Uh, how much time do I have left, by the way? I want to make sure I'm not 10 minutes. Okay, cool, I got me. All right, so with indoor gardening, the reason, let's talk about why you need to do indoor gardening first. Because I, when I first came into this, I didn't understand why you'd want to do that. Long story short, tomatoes take a long time to grow. And if you waited until it was warm enough to plant them outside, then you would not have tomatoes until September, because tomatoes also don't like to produce tomatoes when it's really hot. So if you wait until April and plant tomato seed, you might, if it's a cherry tomato, <clears throat> you might have some before it gets hot, but probably not. It's probably going to be now before you really get tomatoes. But if you start tomatoes indoors in Valentine's Day-ish was when I do, depends on how, it becomes a pain indoors when they get really big and you're trying to like manage these big plants while you're indoors. So there's an art to that. And for Valentine's Day, that's kind of the best for our setup. So we start them on Valentine's Day, tomatoes and peppers and um, broccoli and cabbage, we also start indoors for similar reasons. We start those a little bit earlier though. We start those in January because they can tolerate the cold. So they can go out in February, March sometimes, depending on the weather, our, we our weather's so crazy. So it's hard to know the exact dates. Um, this is a good segue. Our app will give you exact dates based on your location with the plant. And we use the 10% probability of freeze for that date. So our dates are very safe, but there is a slider in the app where you can go be aggressive if you want. If you want to gamble on another freeze date, you can change that date and settings and then it'll, it'll recalculate all that stuff. Um, but. So over the winter, you've got to start the seeds for, you know, for that stuff. And you're not, you don't really want to start that before January. So in, so in November, in December, we're doing a lot of, um, pre of preservation type stuff. So we're, we're harvesting, you know, at the end of, usually around Halloween is when we get that last freeze. And I, I got to go get all those peppers that have been out. And then we have like hundreds of peppers we bring in. And we start doing things like uh, making our own uh, crushed red peppers pizza seasoning and uh, freezing peppers and making a bunch of frozen basil cubes and stuff like that. So we do a lot of that over the winter, a lot of herb preservation too, because we have these monstrous oregano and rosemary plants that we go and we harvest down. Um, I guess that's one thing to mention too. A lot of your perennials need to be chopped down before it gets really cold. Um, and then you can kind of help cover them and uh, uh, put mulch around them to insulate them. That's the thing you can do with those because those leaves and stuff that are on those perennials are going away over the winter. They're all going to die. The plant's going to produce new ones. So you need to harvest all of those. And then you can begin to, you know, preserve those. So we have a dehydrator that we use for some of it. We hang some of them all over our walls. I mean, our, <laughs> our house is crazy. Um, so, and then we make our own seasonings and that's what we do over the winter. You know, we have jars of rosemary and oregano and all that kind of stuff everywhere. And then... And that gets us through the winter on using that stuff. And then pretty soon it's January and we're starting seeds for broccoli and cabbage. And I'm looking through seed catalogs and I'm trying to figure out what type of varieties I want to grow and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and then we're starting to plan. And, and that's what we're hoping our next version of our software is going to help you do, is that whole planning thing, right? Um, we're working to try and partner with a seed company. That way we can get access to their data so that we know... You know, if we have all the varieties of tomatoes and we know where you live and we know what varieties like certain conditions and we can recommend the specific varieties for you. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to build now. So, and the way that you can help us with that is just tell people about the app. It's literally all we need from you. Just, we need people to know about it and we need people to use it. And if our app helps you, then you can, you can click on links in there to buy products that you need. Um, uh, I'm not going to ask you to go buy things you don't need. You know, if, if there's something you need and there's a link for it, you know, you can help us out by buying it. There's also a link in the top right where you can buy anything on Amazon. People buy patio furniture and all sorts of stuff, and it, and it helps us out. So 
Um, if you want to help us out, that's one way you can do it. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and anything else that pops up. We'll be on there too. Uh, luckily, I built automation so I can just press one button and it goes everywhere because I wouldn't be able. I'd be, I went crazy before I built that, trying to manage all the social networks. So, um, thank you everyone for being here and listening and yeah, thank you. Thank you.